This is Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman. This is Lauren Lester, the voice of Robin and Nightwing. And you're listening to the DCAU Review. Hosted by Cal and Liam. Streaming at DCAUReview.com. And on your favorite podcast app. Welcome, everybody, to episode 302 of the DCAU Review. I am one of your hosts, Cal, with me, my good friend and good brother, Liam. Liam, we're continuing here for the final time this month, at least, with a review of Batman the Animated Series. It's been a great month. We've had a lot of memorable, great episodes that we've covered here uh, we've done Riddler's Reform. We've done Second Chance. We even shine the bright uh, DCAU spotlight onto the Dick Grayson Robin character for our 300th episode. It's been a been a fun month, and uh, this week's uh, episode is certainly apropos to continue that legacy of uh, we're going to always remember March of 2024 as the month that uh, we covered all of these bangers after bangers after bangers, or. That either that or we're going to forget immediately next month what we did last <laughs> month. But either way, uh, it's been a memorable one, and we're continuing with another great episode this week. Uh, certainly one that typically ranks fairly high on those listicles of people's as uh, one of the best, if not the best, episode of the entire series. That's right. We are jumping into the episode Harley's Holiday. This episode is almost like a... Uh... Uh, a, a brand unto itself there's statues there's uh merchandise specifically based on this particular uh, episode itself much less as a, a part of this larger animated series so harley's holiday a lot to get into with this one and uh we don't want to waste too much time but of course we must first remind you cal uh we gotta hit, hit us with that air date and uh, let us know who's bringing us this podcast this week. that's right man you you know how to set somebody up for a great spike here we of course are going to get our imdb synopsis from liam in just a second as he always does uh, but as he mentioned we'll remind you this episode originally aired here in the united states on fox kids programming block on october the 15th 1994 which means we have not yet reached the 30th anniversary of this episode we remarked before we went on the air it's pretty late in the uh in the air date run here so uh deep into 1994 with this episode and uh, of course as you mentioned liam it, this episode synopsis is brought to you by the pod tower we invite you to head over today and subscribe to youtube.com slash the pod tower uh if you subscribe there you will get not only our entire podcast library from the very first episode all the way up and including this very episode in addition to every single bonus episode we've ever done uh, all in one convenient streaming platform but you also get uh, two additional dcau themed podcasts from the good folks at the watchtower database with their jump on the bat wagon podcast and the entire tim talk podcasts uh, from start to finish uh, again all in one convenient streaming location head over to youtube.com slash the pod tower today and subscribe that's right so this is the synopsis for harley's holiday which is written by paul dini directed by kevin altieri music by lolita ritmanis and animation by dong yang and that synopsis reads as such on her first day of release, Harley Quinn gets into a ridiculous amount of trouble in record time. <laughs> I mean, it's not inaccurate, and it's actually kind of funny and goes along with the theme mm -hmm. of the episode being a bit of a comedy. So I will take it. I don't think I would give it much higher than maybe a C plus or a B minus, but it's it gets the job done and it, it made me chuckle. Agreed. So as uh, as the aforementioned IMDb synopsis so eloquently put, it is indeed a the episode is opened up as we uh, we are at the old Arkham Asylum and uh, Harley is uh, sitting at the desk uh, along with the doctor, uh, doctor, who's the doctor's name? I always forget. Oh, Leland, Leland, not Vreeland, Leland. We got a Vreeland and a Leland in this episode. Uh, so Dr. Leland is breaking the good news to Harley in that they believe that she is therapeutically cured at this point and is due for her release. And uh, Harley 
uh, does all that she can to keep herself calm, cool, and collected, but just can't help but celebrate. And uh, just as she is receiving this notice from the doctor that she is due her release the very next day, uh, Batman and Robin are walking in, leading in a very, very belligerent scarecrow who is shouting things and screaming. And it's a very funny bit because he's screaming all these things about how they should cower in fear of the god of fear and all of this. And then uh, Harley... Uh, sees them leading him in and says hey dr crane and he stops speaking and says hello my child and then goes back to berating them with these (laughs) these insane uh this insane dialogue so that's okay you have every reason to be proud of yourself unhand me i just wish the other inmates could make your sort of progress I am the master of fear, the lord of despair. Cower before me in witless terror. Hi, Professor Crane. Good evening, child. Worship me, fools. Worship me. Scream hosannas of anguish to Scarecrow, the all terrible god of fear. I think he's getting better. Uh, as they continue, uh, she, uh, Batman stops and. Uh, congratulates her on her soon to be release date and uh, extends a hand out to her, but lets her know that he'll be watching and that she just needs to keep her nose clean and stay out of trouble. And uh, she says, uh, no worries. That's all behind her. Now her days of crime are behind her and she's, she's going to show the world. She's just as sane as anybody else. And uh, it, we'll talk about it. I'm sure in visuals and animation, but the cuts in this, in this episode are just so funny. Everything is just punctuated with uh, hilarious dialogue punctuated by it, following up immediately with a hilarious visual. And this one's no exception is uh, we, we get her saying she's just as sane as anybody. And then we cut to her uh, on the streets in Gotham with people running away, screaming in terror as she is being led down the street, wearing roller skates a uh, a tied up shirt and uh, and booty shorts with uh, with the two hyenas Bud and Lou pulling her along the sidewalk and Bud and Lou are doing nothing uh, short of terrorizing the citizens of Gotham and sh- Harley just seems to be she's like the prototypical dog owner that has is just completely oblivious she has no idea what her dogs are doing she's just enjoying life enjoying the warm summer day. And uh, and uh, totally oblivious that they are are terrifying the citizens of Gotham. She stops on the street uh, again, completely oblivious to the fact that the citizens are upset over these wild animals that are uh, trying to attack their groceries and take their their food from them. Uh, she looks in one of the the shopping windows and notices and thinks that maybe her clothes may be a bit out of date. So she decides to do what else but go on a little shopping trip. I shouldn't have worn this outfit. It's so out of style, it's growing mold. I probably look like a total geek. <laughs> Come on, babies, we're going shopping. So she, Bud, and Lou decide to enter a department store where they're going to get uh, herself a new wardrobe. She sort of has this monologue with the uh, saleswoman who tells her she can't bring Bud and Lou in, but she reminds them that don't worry, they're house trained and uh, continues about her shopping spree. Uh, we uh, in the midst of this, we uh, we find out that she's not the only person at this department store on this very day, but uh, joining her is uh happens to be one billionaire Bruce Wayne and Veronica Vreeland who uh, Veronica apparently is not happy with the fact that Bruce every one of Bruce's suits is brown <laughs> brown brown and and uh yellow with a yellow shirt so uh she even goes so far as to uh as to mock Bruce as they're trying on the clothes she gets him this beautiful like blue suit the sky blue pastel, yeah yeah it's a it's a nice like easter color like and Bruce is not buying it. And she even goes as far as to mock him and ask him who dresses him if if she allows uh, or if he allows Alfred to dress him. And Bruce is sort of blushing. Uh, he hears the commotion and in the commotion, Harley being <laughs> continually dragged around by Bud and Lou, still wearing the roller skates, by the way, uh, trips over something and flies into the waiting arms of Bruce Wayne, whom she thinks uh, thinks looks somewhat familiar and even notices his chin 
uh, seems to be uh, the most familiar part of his face, but then recognizes him as billionaire Bruce Wayne uh, after Bruce has played down that they don't know each other. Uh, But uh, she picks out a new dress while she's there. Uh, She mentions uh, Veronica as she's flirting with Bruce, by the way, Veronica steps up and uh, sort of intervenes. Harley mistakes question mark her as a, perhaps a jealous girlfriend, uh, but also recognizes Veronica. Wow, I never saw them do that before. Hey, don't I know you? I don't think so. Something about that chin. I know. You're Bruce Wayne, the boy billionaire. Hmm, unattached, I see. (laughs) Um, may I help you, miss? Uh Uh-oh, and to the jealous girlfriend. Hey, remember me? That big charity bash a few years back? The one the Joker robbed? I was the clown girl holding the gun on ya! Oh, don't worry, I'm over the crime thing, see? I'm rehabilitated and ready to live my life right. How nice for you. (laughs) Goodbye. Gee, you make one little mistake and they never let you forget. Uh, Veronica is shrinks back in terror, but Harley is quick to produce her certificate of sanity out of her purse, notating that she is 100% sane. It's got a stamp across of it, across the front of it with big red letters that says sane could not be more cartoonishly hilarious. Uh, she shoves it back in her purse and skates away, uh, continuing her monologue, noting that she's ready to start out on a straight and narrow path that uh, maybe someone like her can turn over a new leaf. She's kind of monologuing with this saleswoman who sells her the dress, but uh, Harley pays for it in cash. And as she skates off, uh, she unfortunately was not able to get the security tag off before leaving the store, which sets off the alarm. And uh, sets off what I dare say is a series of unfortunate events for Miss Harley and Quinzel. Uh, yeah, I would say so. So she as she goes to leave the uh, the little alarms. I should know. I worked retail. I should know what those things are called. But the, the little things that go off when you're attempting to walk out of the store uh, and the the things that register that you haven't paid. The sales yeah. sensors or something? I yeah. Think that makes sense. Yeah. But what are those little alarm sensors are by the uh, by the sliding doors? Uh, she uh, they start to go off and the security guard comes running after her and Harley immediately gets very agitated and freaks out trying to protest and claiming that she did pay. Hold it. I didn't do anything. That's a security alarm. Just give me back. That's my dress. I paid for it fair and square. I know. Just let me remove the security tag. It's a frame up. A fix. You ain't taking me back to the slam at John Law. (laughs) What in heaven? Stay here. The uh, security guard believes her and is just trying to remove the little plastic security tag that is still hanging off of the dress and that uh, she didn't allow the cashier to remove either. And uh, but Harley just won't hear it. She's uh, she's panicking, and begins trying to fight the fight the guy and then uh, calls in the hyenas to attack him and even uh, in the in the in the melee there's uh, a couple of the mannequins get thrown through the front window of the department store so bruce uh, makes an excuse to go back in and check on things tries to uh, track down harley in the uh, in the changing area where she is back in the full gesture outfit and uh, is, is uh, <laughs> as she puts out well armed as she has a, a mannequin arm and begins to beat bruce over the head with it it's a very funny scene uh, we'll talk more about that in visuals, certainly. But uh, she runs out. She's still got the roller skates on, too. Which yes. Is good. So she's roller skating through the uh, the hyenas are still attacking the security guard. She runs out. She sees Veronica waiting in this convertible where she was waiting for Bruce and dives right into the front seat, tackling Veronica into the car. 
and then calls the hyenas in to the car with her and they go speeding off uh, in the process angering uh, one of one of the first uh, sort of wacky races style uh, uh, chasers she'll have for this episode as she uh, causes a bit of a traffic accident including uh, having Harvey Bullock swerve off and crash his car for the first time so bullock goes off chasing after him and uh, batman and robin will not be too far behind here uh, we then cut to gordon's office where we see a gentleman in full military regalia including like the helmet and everything uh, <laughs> uh just stopping around jim gordon's office demanding some answers as to what happened Uh, Gordon uh, again tries to stick up for Harley says that she must have just been confused and panicked and is terrified of going back to Arkham and he uh, is trying to urge restraint the uh, general who we find out is actually Veronica's father actually just recently reappeared in some of the Adventures Continue comics Mm -hmm. uh, last year but uh, yeah we uh, are two years ago now I think that was season two but uh yeah they uh they he, he kind of freaks out on gordon a little bit and uh, knocks over gordon's coffee before seemingly composing himself and just asking gordon to do all he can to to get his little girl back and uh, gordon agrees and walks out of the office though right as he does <laughs> the general gets on the phone and declares a code red situation to whoever is on the other line the most stereotypically military man, military man. Yeah, I think there's a specific <laughs> influence. I'll talk about it in visuals. But uh, yes, it's very, just very over the top. And yes, he declares code red as we uh, as we cut there to uh, Harley uh, with uh, with Veronica and Doe has made a decision. She's going to try to get out of town to avoid, uh, to avoid Batman or the police tracking her down. Please. go i'm rich i'll pay whatever you want if you'll just Ah! Uh uh-oh company hi b-man wanna race stop the car now i think not we want to help you sort this out before it gets worse sure like you helped poor professor crane last night sorry boys you ain't taking me back to arkham so she heads off to uh, box old Boxy Bennett, who we uh, previously saw in Harlequinade. Uh, has to be that a that he he has to be like a uh, like a Paul. Is he a Paul Dean? Like a, I guess technically a Paul Dean in creation, you would assume. Or yeah, no. I mean he wrote the first episode with him in it too. So. Right. It just it, one of those things that we talk about where Paul Dini loves, like he creates these little characters and he just loves reusing them again. So it was Absolutely. cool to see him pop up. Yes, it's very much in the way of like, well, it could have just been any mob guy or another character, but no, make it the same mob guy from the previous episode. It's more fun that way um, yeah. to have that little extra bit of continuity. But yes, Boxy uh, isn't quite so happy about the idea of helping Harley after the events of uh of Harlequinade where she uh, brought Batman and Robin down on him and got his casino uh, busted up. But uh, she, she gives him a little kiss and, and lets him know that she's going to be, uh, she'll, she'll be friendly if he'll be friendly, so to speak. And uh, Boxy is agreeable to that and decides they're going to ransom off uh, Veronica and, uh, and figure out what to do about getting Harley out of town later. But Harley is, having a little bit of a, a crisis of conscience still and doesn't want to uh, to ransom off Veronica because she actually does want to go straight. She actually does want to uh, to live a normal life and just wants to get out of town and, and let Veronica go back to uh, to her life when she's done. Boxy's not so sure about that. And uh, as he tries to uh, threaten both of the women, Batman and Robin come in uh, for some fisticuffs here. Again, we'll talk about the sequence more in visuals for sure, but they have a bit of a dust up with all of the thugs and Boxy as well. Boxy seemingly has uh, kind of has Harley dead to rights, but then she calls in the hyenas once again <laughs> and uh, they, they really take a, take a, take him apart. And so she grabs Veronica in the melee and she is, she and Veronica escape in the, uh, in the convertible on, on the way as uh, as batman robin and uh, and boxy are left uh, left in the lurch a little bit and uh, so as uh, as harley and veronica speed away they have a little bit of a heart to heart and uh, harley promises that she's going to uh, to release veronica once she figures out how to get out of town 
And uh, at that moment, as they have a moment of peace, as, uh, as they both seem to relax a little bit, there's suddenly a very large explosion next to their car. And what do we see in the background, in the rearview mirror? But uh, Veronica's father on a giant tank coming towards them, demanding she release the <laughs> hostage and firing tank rounds at her. There's... <laughs> There, there might be a metaphor for like U.S. Uh, U.S. foreign military intervention in here somewhere, uh, but yes, there's a so there's now a tank hot on the trail, and uh, and Harley, Harley uh, is not so willing to uh, to re- reunite Veronica with her dad just yet. That's right, uh, Veronica. the The line that Veronica gives of "That's my dad," and then Harley said, "No, that's not your dad. That's your dad in a tank." Boxy has also been in hot pursuit. It's a it's a wild goose chase as we also have Harvey Bullock, who's he, speaking of just the worst day ever. You mm-hmm. know, uh, Harley later on talks about having a bad day. Everybody else in this in this episode could also chalk this up to having <laughs> a bad day. Uh, Boxy's having a bad day. Like everything was fine. He was at his fish market, like playing. <laughs> playing craps with his gang of creepy men. And then all of a sudden Harley shows up and upsets the apple cart. And suddenly he's missing his pants and driving a fish truck to try and chase after her. Harvey Bullock has been trying to catch Harley since the initial incident at the department store and keeps his automobile keeps getting crushed (laughs) or crashed into or destroyed in various different ways. Uh, So as, as, and and now of course we have the uh, the tank in pursuit of Harley. So Harley turns around in the uh, completely opposite direction of the tank, headed back towards the city. Boxy, who's been chasing her, catches uh, on that she's turned around. Turns around to chase her. The tank goes completely off the side of the <laughs> uh, of the overpass and down to chase uh, Harley as well. And then uh, Bullock also in pursuit at this point, as you mentioned, one of the uh, tank rounds uh, hits and and nearly uh, well in in while Har- Harvey was in pursuit, an eighteen wheeler spun around and turned his uh, his nice sedan into into a. Uh, into a top a, a, a car without a top say a, a convertible at that point uh so he's he's been stuck after he ran into a fire hydrant uh he gets on the radio they hear that there's uh, that harley's been spotted he he was changing his tires somehow his car is able to move enough even though it's <laughs> losing pieces as it drives down the road uh he's also in hot pursuit and wouldn't you know batman and robin in the batmobile also now a part of the chase <laughs> as they catch up to harley who can't believe her luck she heads towards Gotham City Square, which is uh stand in or is depending on uh I, I bet if we had a uh, friend of the show, Kevin Altieri on the sh- on the show, he would probably just go ahead and say this is Times Square. Mm-hmm. Uh it's Times Square. They head towards uh Gotham City Square and uh there's a convergence at that point with Harley. Uh she does uh mention uh, and have this conversation. I think you may, you may have mentioned it, but Veronica promises that as long as she gets home safe, uh, she's going to drop any charges against Harley. And uh, Harley kind of sees that as a good thing and as an opportunity, sort of a silver lining to the, the mess that she's facing. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I mentioned, they she uh, Harley eventually uh, sees the Batmobiles caught up, pops a Yui, and uh, she eventually just stops her car in the middle of Gotham city square as uh, the three or four points of all of these people that are chasing her converge at once. The tank shows up, boxy shows up and Harvey Bullock all show up at the same time, <laughs> converging on this one little car. And they, the tank just rides over the car and crushes everybody. They all smash into one super exciting car and tank crash. Trouble 
making clown. <laughs> Veronica? Uh... Hey, bird boy! Look alive! Oh! Ooh. Well, that's my good deed for the day. Bye! Wait! And uh, Veronica's dad looks down in horror. Batman and Robin are also ho- horrified. Uh, as uh, B- as Boxy gets out of the car to investigate, and uh, just then, from from up above, uh, Harley gets Robin's attention and drops Veronica into his waiting arms, and uh, she's escaped uh, by climbing up uh, and uh, onto one- some of the billboards in the area, and that leads us to our next part of the uh, the episode, which is a funny little chase sequence that happens. Batman chases her up onto the roof. Uh, Boxy tries to get away, by the way, but uh, mm-hmm. ultimately is apprehended by Harvey <laughs> Bullock. <laughs> I don't want to undercut this because it's so funny. Yeah, Boxy tries to run away. He's in, we'll talk about it. He's in his boxer shorts, his right. red-hearted boxer shorts, like a complete Looney Tunes character. Yep. And get Robin ties him up. And Boxy, who has just been in a head-on collision with a cop and was trying to to uh, commit vehicular manslaughter, is like, you got nothing on me. <laughs> Tummy, it's so funny though. Like it's it's such a great gag. Uh, You know, and Bullock walks up and grabs him by the collar and says, "I think I can figure something out," and and takes him away to be arrested. It's Uh, it's like the idea of saying you got nothing on me right after you were in a head-on collision with a five-star general and a cop. Uh, yeah, we're moments away from talking about Paul Dini's absolutely off the wall insane writing for this episode. Uh, as we as we wrap it up here, uh, Batman chases Harley up onto the rooftops, uh, where he again he this whole time he's been trying to encourage her to s- simply stop and see if they can sort out the misunderstanding because mm-hmm. he sort of he's been rooting for her from the beginning. And is trying to empathize and and be compassionate towards her and trying to understand the situation and sees that it's it's a domino effect of of things that have occurred on that day that have just escalated everything. And he's trying to stop the dominoes from falling, so to speak. And uh, Harley just unfortunately won't listen to him. So they're uh, on this rooftop and uh, they're jumping from rooftop to rooftop. Uh, some some great visuals we'll talk about. Uh, Batman smashes into a uh, into one of the neon signs and Harley's on one of the other ones. She said that uh, she boils it down to she's having a bad you day. Quit, do you? Listen to me. All the work you've done, your freedom. If you run away, you'll lose them, Harley. You're so close to winning back your real life. Why risk it now? I'm having a bad day. I'm sick of people trying to shoot me, run me over, and blow me up. I didn't even get to keep my new dress. And I actually paid for it. be good. I really did. But if that's not good enough, fine. Let's get back to basics. Which, uh, of course, is a great callback to The Killing Joke, uh, Alan Moore's legendary a Joker story where uh, where he's the Joker has just one bad day, and that's ultimately what leads to him becoming the Joker. Uh, Harley says she's having a bad day, and that uh, she's tired of being uh, attempted to be run over, killed, shot at, uh, and lists the litany of things that she's already experienced that day. She said, "But if things are going to be just what they are, then uh, you know she's going to return to her roots and go back and play the hits." So she pulls out a a Joker grenade. And uh, gets ready to throw it at a, uh, a incapacitated Batman who's still recovering from running into a giant neon mouth. And uh, it is at that point that Batman realizes it, is qu- thinks quickly and throws a batarang, knocking it out of her hand, which causes the grenade to land behind the billboard that Harley is on. She is uh, she is 
hanging on for dear life, falls off of that, lands into another billboard that is a child child eating off of a spoon. The spoon launches her onto a bottle of Coca-Cola that is uh, another neon billboard. She's hanging on to the straw of the uh, the glass bottle of Coca-Cola and says, talk about grasping at straws uh, and uh, begins to fall. But Batman is able to swoop in and save her at the last second. And uh, it's determined at that point that unfortunately uh, Harley's Harley's headed back to her uh, to her her old stomping grounds of Arkham Asylum at this point. That's right. So we get a, a, a little postscript scene to end, end the episode. Uh, very similar, only this time instead of Scarecrow, it's Harley being led back into Arkham uh, in cuffs. But once again, Dr. Leland is uh, is there to meet her and it tries to encourage Harley and tells her that uh, it's only a small setback thanks to uh, Veronica not pressing any charges on her and that if she really work, does the work that she could be uh, back out and free in no time. And uh, Batman and Harley have a little heart to heart here. And she asks why Batman was so uh, intent on giving her second, third and fourth chances when, when she's done nothing but cause him trouble over the years. And uh, as you, you alluded to here, Cal, it's, it's the, it's the whole point of the episode. Uh, He tells her that he understands what it's like to try to rebuild your life after, uh, you know, after a tragic event. again home again jiggity jig not for too long though miss vreeland dropped the kidnapping charges with a little more hard work you should be ready to re-enter society for good yay there's one thing i gotta know how'd you stay with me all day risking your butt for someone who's never given you anything but trouble i know what it's like to try and rebuild a life i had a bad day too once Nice guys like you shouldn't have bad days. So he he pulls out the dress that she had she had bought for herself but didn't get to wear uh, back at the uh, back at the department store. She's uh, so elated she kisses him once and then uh, enjoys herself enough that she's going to go back in for a second one. As uh, as Robin and Poison Ivy, I, I love this cutaway to Robin and Poison Poison Ivy just standing there looking at it. Uh, and then uh, as uh, as uh, she gets uh, as she as uh, she finishes up and is being led into her cell, uh, she tells Batman to give her a call and he tells her not to press her luck. And we get a little uh, postscript there as, as 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 Robin and Batman walk out of the asylum and Harley goes to her cell. She stops and looks at Poison Ivy and tells her to mind her own business <laughs> and then walks away. And that's <laughs> the end of our episode. It's a really quirky Again, very, very Looney Tunes style way to even end the episode too. So yeah, I was surprised we didn't just do the uh, the close out circle fade fade yes. out there. Uh, uh, yeah, would have on Harley or or uh, or Ivy at that point. One hundred percent, we were we were just missing that. But yeah, it's a fun little uh, bit at the end of her her uh, telling Ivy off a little bit as as she walks back into her cell. So that's where uh, where we wrap it up. As we've already uh, alluded to quite a bit here, Cal. Uh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. This episode is so fun and it's so silly. And it's like I said, there's, it feels like there's a lot of, a lot of Looney Tunes, a lot of Chuck Jones, Tex Avery, screwball cartoon comedy in this. There's like maybe some wacky racist stuff with all the, the different, the different guys. Uh, and then there, I'm there, I, I think there's a movie. I'm trying to think, I was thinking like, like blues brothers kept coming to mind. Cause there's the scene at the end of that first movie, I think where there's like a hundred cop cars all crash yeah. at the end yeah. of that movie. Um, I don't know if that's a specific influence. I'm sure there's other movies that I, even that scene I think is like lampooning another movie too. So I, I, if you know, if there's a specific homage here that we're missing, please uh, hit us up on, uh, on Twitter or Instagram at DCAU review and let us know. But uh, yeah, I think this uh, is so much fun. The, the weird chasing with all the different people chasing Harley, the idea that it all, it all sp- spirals out of control because she she forgot to take this or let the security guard uh, take the tag off of her dress mm-hmm. and she just freaks out and immediately calls in a pair of hyenas to attack him <laughs> like there's just so much it's so screwy and funny in this episode it's uh yeah it's uh it's just a delight it is yeah it's non-stop from beginning to end uh there's there's a lot of funny 
funny visuals we'll talk about but the dir- the dir- the direction went hand in hand with uh with the writing mr dini we've talked about it before to to be able to to run the gamut in in like the style of writing he can write such deep thought provoking tragic heartstring pulling stories mm-hmm. and he can also write just the goofiest off the wall comedic takes on things and uh it's 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 the dichotomy of man two side you know same (laughs) brain and two two completely different styles of storytelling coming out of his head just wow what an immense talent is uh is all that i came away with thinking about after this episode because it's it's absolutely true like what what an incredible it's just a fun goofy take on the story obviously he being one of the co-creators of this character harley Mm -hmm. understands this character in such a a deep way because it it came from his brain like this is what he had in mind and it's interesting because you can see some of the influence in this if you saw what ultimately is probably a forgettable movie but at the time i didn't i did not dislike the movie but the birds of uh, prey movie the harley Mm -hmm. quinn birds of prey there's some of the very same elements of that like oh absolutely uh, of of the of this very episode in that in that in that characterization in that that uh in that movie so the going back and seeing this year this years later after harley has become such a focal point and popular figure in the dc universe uh, both in live action, comics, all of the the like the the trip that she's been on. This is quite the, uh, you know the the kickoff point for this character to not only this is her first appearance essentially as a standalone character. Joker doesn't show up one bit. That was something that was very interesting to me that you could have done the Joker as the person she goes to hide out with, but instead. She picks Boxy mm-hmm. instead. So you're deliberately keeping the spotlight shining on her for this episode, allowing her to be the focal point and not be overshadowed by the most famous supervillain of all time and letting her stand on her own. Um, just a brilliant choice. And then just the way that things spiral out of control here and just you you see the dominoes fall and you while it's comedic there is a bit of tragedy to it as we we talked about like this character just she's doing her best like she's trying her best and who can't relate to just having that day where just everything seems to be going wrong and like the decision and finally just at the end of it you're just ready to give up you're just like screw it it doesn't matter like it things are not gonna change nothing's gonna be different you wake up you're like today's gonna be different i'm gonna you know get up on this side of the bed i'm Mm -hmm. gonna exercise i'm gonna eat clean and then right as you soon as you get to work somebody yells at you you know you you get into a fender bender in the parking lot you know you you forgot your lunch it just the stuff stacks up and just by by three o'clock you're just like i'm i'm done i'm just i'm just gonna go eat taco bell and be sad <laughs> <laughs> just me no so no, no one... absolutely I hate everyone. <laughs> everyone that's that's like january 2nd every year right, right. <laughs> uh you know no every uh everybody goes through that but yeah it is it is funny as as much as we talk about as much as the the comedy is so over the top and we'll certainly talk about that in visuals as well you know there's there's like four car crashes in this episode and all these over the top <laughs> explosions and and silliness even the end when like harley drops the grenade and the whole uh you know the whole uh billboard explodes it's, it's like the action even the action is so over the top it's almost like a like a wily coyote you know wily coyote cartoon or something but it also has this very kind of sweet h- heart and soul to it from you know everyone really almost everyone even veronica is very understanding of Harley and you know, you see, you see Dr. Leland, you see Batman and Robin, you see, uh, you see commissioner Gordon, you know, all of these people want to give her the benefit of the doubt are trying to, you know, take it easy on her, tell trying to get her to calm down, but she just has such a, she just panics and, and freaks out and, and can't, uh, and can't quite hear what anyone is saying to her. Can't quite, uh, can't quite bring herself to believe what anyone is uh, what is uh, saying to her, and and then that that nice little yeah that nice little postscript there where Batman 
even now, once she's relapsed, once she's put the clown suit back on and kidnapped, uh, you know, kidnapped a woman and and all of this stuff, almost killed him with a grenade. He's still there at the end, and to, him and Doctor Leland and 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 are still there, still there to tell her that hey, it doesn't just because today didn't go well doesn't mean that tomorrow can't. Like it's a very hopeful and optimistic way to end, and and to put that that bit of sweetness and, and heart and, and compassion uh, into this episode where you could have just ended it on another joke, right? You could have just ended it with him catching Harley and her saying, I made a mess on your Cape. And like, it would have been a, still been a great episode. Yep. Um, but I think that, that post uh, that little, that little postscript at the end, that final scene and really bookending it with those two scenes in Arkham. I think it, it the episode has a really lovely like bit of heart and compassion shown and i think that's i know that's a hot button issue with uh, how different people view batman and again i don't necessarily think there's a right or a wrong way to to, there's a lot of different versions but i think wrong way is the batman that kills i'm just gonna (laughs) controversial stance (laughs) wow (laughs) actually having a strong opinion about people argue that on the internet the the, i'm doing the meme with the guy standing up in the crowd of people the (laughs) painting of the man standing Kill yeah. Batman killing is a bad thing. <laughs> I agree. I, I generally agree. But it's it's nice, I think, especially for this version of Batman. And we again, we just talked about it last week in a much more serious episode in Second Chance. But that, you know, he's not just getting, you know, he's not doing this because he gets his jollies out of it. Like he's not. That's always, you know, again, kind of a flippant, like very, very Reddit, uh, you know, 2010s Twitter take to be like, oh, he just beats on the mentally handicapped people and he doesn't even care about him. He's just a rich kid getting his kicks and all that. It's like, no, he's he wants these people to get better and he's encouraging them and 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 doing what he can to facilitate that. And, you know, the the physicality, the the fisticuffs only come out when it's absolutely necessary. So it's it's fun to see Batman in this role where he's really uh, you know the whole time, even when he's out of the costume and he's Bruce, like he's trying to to reach her and get her to to, to calm down and, and, and think logically. And she's just not having it. But even again, once once she does screw up, he still is is there for her and is still there to encourage her that, uh, that she could still get better. So it's, I really love that. Like, it's such a nice bit of, this could just be wall to wall comedy and it would still be a hoot. But, uh, but that, that heart that they give this episode as well. And and the, the way that you see Batman, especially how much he cares and wants the city and, and Harley individually to, to get better is, is really sweet as well. Yeah, no, that, that little underlying, story that they're telling and it starts through it starts throughout i mean it's it's from the very beginning he him shaking her hand and like hey i'm going to keep my eye on you just letting her know that he's going to be watching but does so as like an encouragement sort of like the fatherly Mm -hmm. figure a fatherly figure to her and then uh you know he sees things starting to spiral out of control as bruce and he even goes in you know hey you don't want you know you don't want this to go down on on your first day out he's like trying to encourage her then when they're pulling up alongside of her rather than you know shredding the tires on the car or something like that like we've seen the batmobile do before he just pulls alongside her tries to get her attention tells her to pull over that you know they want to work things out before things you know continue to get crazy and that happens all the way up until uh you know the Times square stuff and even then from the rooftops he's still trying to get her to just surrender so they can work things out so um yeah the fact that that uh it it's mostly a harley episode obviously you it's harley gags it's harley interacting with people but uh kind of like the sneaky back subplot is that that batman is actually a, a compassionate character and somebody that truly cares about seeing those that he believes can be reformed be reformed so yeah it's a it's a great plot um it's funny i i ended up watching this episode twice uh i had time enough to watch it twice uh for before we did our review and uh, i was the first time i was like i I think i'm gonna give this a 10 out of 10 it's like but i'll just watch it a second time with with more critical eyes and if something doesn't stand out right i'm i'm gonna call it out and i was like nope 10 out of 10 that's my score for the the episode's plot this week is a perfect 10 out of 10 and uh, i am right there with you i also gave it a 10 out of 10 i just again we already talked about it you already touched on it just how 
the, how well Paul Dini knows Harley's voice. Like, obviously, and again, you could say it's because it's, you know, it's his, his co-creation. So, of course, she does. But just there's so many funny lines and the way that she is so over the top and so screwball and so she's such a Looney Tunes character to an extent, but also feels like, you know, and we'll, again, we'll talk about this later in voice, voice acting. But again, she still feels like a real person somehow at the same time. Like it's a, it's a weird uh, tightrope that he walks, but yeah, this is uh this is, this is a masterpiece. Absolutely. Yeah. This, this episode even more so because we get, we get her dialogue, you know, there are some times where she seems really sane, but then there's other times where, like the interaction with with Boxy, which is a little bit awkward. They obviously are in this two females in a very gigantic, brutish man centered mm-hmm. area, and they do everything they can to visually intimate what they're these men are thinking about having these two dames in their presence. And she sticks up. It's like, no, we're not going to do anything to Veronica. We're not doing, she's under my protection. We're taking care of her. Like she shows, she shows compassion and she shows that she's changing through this. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a brilliant balance of that. She's, and I, and I think ultimately we can probably say what led to her becoming kind of what she is nowadays, which is more of an anti-hero or, you know, somebody that, kind of treads that line and flips back and forth between being a villain or being a, a, a villain with a, with a heroic side at times, like a, a darker, a dark comedy uh, hero at times. So yeah, she's it's, this is laying the foundation for people to then later on in the, you know, in those other runs kind of create that, that uh, or build upon that, that same backstory. So uh, yeah, no, no choice from both of us uh, and and really no surprise that we both gave the plot 10 out of 10. Absolutely. All right, Liam, let's move on to our next category, which is animation and visuals. By the way, we're on a five, I believe we're on a five score streak here for the same exact scores. We had all four of our scores last week, exactly the same. We're now one for one this week. I'm interested to see how long we can keep this streak going. We've never done it. We've never had the same exact score for the same exact uh, uh, categories two weeks straight. So that would be a first if we were going to go go that route. So we'll see here as we get into animation and visuals. Dong Yang responsible for the animation this week. And of course, a good friend of the show, Kevin Altieri, was the director for this week. And um I will start with the the animation from Dong Yang. Some really cool stuff in this episode. Some really great looking things. And I think some really off model and weird looking things <laughs> uh, was was my ultimate sort of breakdown of things there. I love the uh, the sequence in Gotham, Gotham City Square uh, on top mm-hmm. of the rooftops, the neon signs. Yes. What a great place to like have a, a final fight. Uh, between the two of them uh, just interacting with all of the billboards and the neon Mm -hmm. signs. And uh, there was a lot of consistency too. And I can't imagine that that would be very easy to do because the signs, several of the signs are actually animated. So they're moving. So you're, you're creating like a repeating effect of animation in the background, as opposed to it just being a static background with the characters moving in front of it. So I imagine that was probably incredibly difficult to sort of master. And even from scene to scene with different, uh, with different uh, angles of, of how the characters are standing, or what have you, keeping that continuity and consistency of the same uh, billboards, really, really impressive. Um, mm-hmm. With that said, I think there are times where from scene to scene, the characters look very odd. Uh, they don't don't have the same look from scene to scene. Uh, there's Batman looks very off model at times. Um, and uh, that took me out uh, of several scenes, I would say. Uh, but then building back on things, I, th- I think there's actually a lot of fun. As you mentioned, there's a car crash every 60 seconds. It feels like in this, <laughs> in this episode, uh, there's some sort of wacky hijinks that's occurring uh i you know it, we can go through and kind of talk about our 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 highlights of the actual you know visuals and stuff like that but uh what did you think of the the overall animation this week from dong yang yeah there's some some very drastic movements that i feel like we don't normally get in our when it's just two people talking in this show like it's 
very over the top, very, you know, animated for lack, lack of a better term. Um, there's not a lot of like, there's not uh, any static imagery really <laughs> in this episode. It's, it's very, uh, it, it moves a lot. And there's a lot of, uh, I believe, I believe Kevin referred to it as squash and stretch where you're, you play a little faster and looser with the models to allow them to do more sort of over the top uh, cartoony things. Right. And, uh, and yeah, I think that's a, for what this episode is. I think that works a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, the only things like uh, that took me out, I would say, is Batman's model very inconsistent. Mm-hmm. That's the thing for me. And we talk about this all the time. But if it was consistent for the whole episode, I think uh, it would it would be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but it feels to me like the a lot of the issues with scaling. That like there's a shot when when Harley goes up to Bruce in the department store where he looks like he's like eight feet tall and six <laughs> feet wide. Uh-huh. Um, and there's a shot of uh, of Batman on the rooftop at the end where he's walking, and he's his shoulders are so broad and his head is so small that he looked like um, the lizard guys from the live action Super Mario Brothers movie from the 90s. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's just so that to me is like the biggest thing. I thought Batman's model especially was wildly inconsistent. Um, There's there's little extra detailing. And again, maybe that that comes from the the influence of doing this more over the top uh, cartoony episode and and, uh, all of the, the, the females eyes. They have like a little extra. They have like a little extra detailing in them, and they're all they're all sort of brightly colored, mm-hmm. um, which yep. uh, and uh, they don't uh, necessarily have like the the black pupil in the eye. They have they have like the, the kind of the white. I guess it's supposed to be like r- light reflecting in their eyes. Looks a little bit more like Eastern animation as well. Agreed. Um, again, I think I settled into most of it. The only ones I didn't really like, as far as uh, is Batman himself, just because it's it's pretty in- inconsistent throughout the uh, throughout the episode, but it's just, yeah, there's so much good and like, again, little things, like you said, like Bull- Bullock's car getting increasingly damaged in every accident to uh, the point where he's driving away and he drives over the fire hydrant. So the water shoots up and you just see parts falling off of the car. Like it's such a good gag. There's a lot of great like <laughs> sight gags like that. I already mentioned Boxy in his in his red heart underwear running around with like his torn up suit jacket is great. Um the the general General Vreeland, I'm pretty sure, is based off of uh the 1970 movie Patton. Ah, okay. uh, play George C. Scott's Patton. That's the you magnificent bastard. I've read your book. If you, if you know that uh, <laughs> you know that famous scene that's it's it's i mean it's a, it's a it's a general with that helmet and those goggles so not it, not the general from the insurance company <laughs> american insurance company right no not uh, i think i think maybe this inspired that general but uh, <laughs> but yeah so i think there's like some really fun character designs like i said the and like how uh, like veronica's getting increasingly disheveled as the episode goes on and like yep. her hair's getting more fr- you know frizzy and like her sleeves are ripped off her dress and all this stuff like it's there's some really really great visual gags the tank driving off like through the median on the bridge and rolling down over the cars uh just just really good bits of uh of visual comedy uh all throughout this that that enhance an already very funny script yeah absolutely uh i even though the inconsistency with the uh, some of the animation and the models and stuff like that. There were a lot of things that I thought were really impressive. Like we said, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe 40% of the episode feels like they're it's in the car and they're <laughs> driving a convertible. Harley's driving a convertible. So the wind has to whip through there, through her, like her suit. So you get her pigtails flying behind her in her Harley mask, which is, I don't know. I'm not an animator. I imagine it's probably a little bit easier to animate than hair. But you have Veronica in the car also, who from scene to scene is either in the front or in the back seat. And she has to sit there and they have to animate her hair flying. The Batmobile pulls up mm-hmm. next to it. And Batman, you know, uh, tries to talk to Harley. The, the The top slides forward on the Batmobile and Robin's hair is flailing in the wind. Um, as you said, I, I think... 
there's so many things that feel make this feel like a a Tex Avery or a a Looney Tune or even a Tiny Tune cartoon or something uh, of the time, um, and some of the you know some of the the facial uh, responses that the characters have, uh, some of the character models themselves. I love when uh, Harley decides she's going to go into the department store, they cut to Bud and Lou who look at each other and they like cock their eyes at each other. Yes. Like <laughs> we're going to go in the department store. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like totally, uh, huh? you know, totally goofy and unrealistic, but like on brand for this is a cartoon and the, the cartoon dogs are like, is this woman messing with us? Like, what right. are we talking? What is she talking right. about? We're going we're, into the store. <laughs> you're waiting for Mel Blanc. Or 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 an uh, you know appropriate era Looney Tunes or Flintstones voice actor to be like, it's a living like right. that kind of like right. yeah, where you cut back to the animal and they're and they're given giving her the side eye yeah it's That's a great right. bit that that was great I love so when she's leaving the store initially and the, of course the security guard stops her she six button Lou on them then she runs back into the dressing room and we cut back. Uh, after she's beaten Bruce with the with the mannequin arm, which of course a perfect Paul Dini gag. Mm-hmm. He absolutely just I know you know he was cackling to himself about the idea <laughs> of her grabbing a mannequin arm, saying that she's armed, and then hitting Bruce and assaulting other patrons with that <laughs> same arm. Like it's, it's a joke so great and so perfect for Harley that you're like, how did they wait this long <laughs> into the series to pull that one out? Right. Absolutely. I mean, it's so good that the recent the the recent Mondo Toys uh, one six Harley Quinn figure came with a uh, mannequin arm, and uh, Paul Dini himself on Twitter mentioned he thought it was just hilarious that it came with that and the uh, and the copy of her her certificate saying that she was sane. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he loved he loves that bit to this day. Uh, that you know writing that but a- as she's leaving and she gets into the into the convertible and she calls the calls bud and lou over they're still like you can see the the silhouettes of them going after the security guard and he's like holding them at bay with a mannequin body it's i i was i was no good i was losing it he just standing there like jostling at them with this mannequin <laughs> body that's missing its arms and they're like trying to hold them at bay and then harley calls them into the car they they stop what they're doing and jump at the car uh just so funny uh similarly you know when she six she six bud and lou on boxy later on uh in the uh at the fish market it's uh you know i, I think it's the best uh it's the preamble to aces uh sh- show up at uh during return of the joker where he's you know where terry six him on on the joker during mm-hmm. their fight uh it's the, it's the best sneak up attack uh, that that uh from an animal since then i'd say that i've seen uh but i, I love that as you mentioned they go they go crazy they they even like they cut away and you just hear them sort of mauling him and then they cut <laughs> back to him and he's just kind of like tr- again trying to hold him at bay with his arms he's now disheveled his whole suit is torn and then he runs to get in the truck and they pull his pants off <laughs> just like a completely three stooges goofy like <laughs> hilarious bit with the uh, you know the pants coming off at the end and as you mentioned of course she's wearing heart boxers you couldn't have a cartoon character wearing anything else uh underneath of it but um I do think so. We don't have a lot of actual fighting or action here because most of our action mm-hmm. takes place as car chases or tank chases uh, towards the end. But the little fight that we get between Batman and Robin and Boxy's men, I think, is pretty good. I love Robin's ingenuity. You know, it's it's it's. Uh, we talked about it last week. Uh, a show, a Robin showcase. This week, he doesn't quite. I wouldn't call this by any means a Robin showcase episode, but he at least does get to do some some cool stuff here and fighting. He grabs a pair of fish and uses them as nunchucks <laughs> and uh, whacks a couple of guys. Everybody in that scene is getting whacked in the face with fish. Uh, all of Bugsy's <laughs> gang or Boxy's gang get get whacked in the face with fish by different Harley whacks somebody in the face with fish. Robin's whacking people in the fish. He's, he's you know, turning people, uh, turning the fish stand over and having guys slip on the ice. <laughs> uh, just a pretty fun. And Batman's got a broomstick. He's just taking people out with his giant <laughs> stick. And then I love the end of the fight. It's just one guy who's standing there against Batman. 
and you're used to Batman doing the no look punch to knock the guy out from, <laughs> that's coming from behind. But this mm-hmm. is sort of the inverse of this. The guy decides he's going to turn and run and instead knocks himself out by running into a pole. So, yeah, you know, <laughs> just just so funny. So, so good. Um, there's there's a lot, like I said, to enjoy from this. The progressive destruction of of uh of bullock's car you know him him going from the beginning like just having a little fender bender and then he smashes into another car mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden he's chasing after him he, his car gets turned into a convertible and then he smashes into a fire hydrant i was gonna say that people. that like sequence of events where the tank goes fires <laughs> off bullock swerves somebody else swerves then the 18 wheeler with the fuel truck spins bullocks get bullock gets <laughs> the top of his car gets crushed as he drives underneath of it and then you see the driver running out and we just see this massive explosion go off <laughs> incredible incredible like chain reaction of events rube goldberg machine of commerce <laughs> <laughs> oh perfectly said yeah um i again there are some things that I, I don't like as far as the character models and some of the ways that thing, things look. So that did take me out. There are some, I would say, some ugly looking characters in this uh, in certain scenes. But uh, I love the fact that we get a, a different look from Bruce. He's wearing he's wearing a different tone colored brown suit instead of his standard <laughs> brown suit. Yeah, like a khaki suit. This time. Yeah. Yeah, he went all khaki instead of the brown and khaki. Uh, similar to, I think, the look that we saw maybe in the... Was in the last Rachel Ghoul episode? He was wearing, he was rocking a similar suit. He had like a oh, safari man. looking, yeah. looking suit there too. Uh, yeah, all, all that to say, uh, I, I really liked most of most of the uh, the stuff here, uh, but there were a couple things that took me out that I that I wasn't a fan of the way that people look. So uh, overall, I still want. I think it's if the action and the comedy didn't work so well, like this, as you mentioned, this is such a visually, there's so many visual gags from Mm -hmm. characters reactions to the things that are happening to heart boxers to, you know, the, the stuff, her hanging onto the, the Coke bottle straw at the end, like all of that uh, works out so, so, so hilariously and works in with, with everything that's happening visually. So for that reason, I actually went with an eight out of 10 for my visuals. Um, not, not a perfect score. It's not a perfectly done animated episode. Uh, but I, I still think that more than it, more than makes up with the, the visual timing, the comedy beats, the, you know, the different things that uh, we pointed out as, as being, uh, things that, that we liked or were, were funny or added to the, added to the visual comedy. Yeah, I uh, I gave it seven out of ten, so that breaks our streak. But uh, yeah, still, like I said, the 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 bat Batman was really I thought the <laughs> the the one uh, downgrade just his uh, his scaling and and uh, and uh, and and modeling was just uh, pretty inconsistent, even from shot to shot. I thought, but overall, that's that's hardly the point because, like <laughs> you said, it's 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 all of the the over the top comedy. It's a lot of stuff. You know, we've talked about that. There's a reason that like the same three explosions get used and reused and reused all the way through to like when they were doing Justice League Unlimited, they're still using like explosions they made on new Batman adventures. Like mm-hmm. it's not easy. And there's a lot of explosions. And I didn't I didn't parse out any that looked like they were reused. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's like there's a lot of uh you know very over the top uh special effects for lack of a better uh word that's you know a real credit to Dong Yang, which is again, I, and I know Kevin has talked about that on episodes with us in the past where, you know, you, depending on what studio got his episode, that would inform how he would, how he would direct it, how, how, how he and his team would board the episode because they would know, you know, what, what this studio can do and what they couldn't do. And, you know, you talked about, you know, he wouldn't have given things to, uh, you know, to Akum or, or, or Dong Yang that he would have given to TMS. I think he used the, the Clayface episode as an example, but, mm-hmm. um, and I think that that's a great example of here of, you know, the directing the storyboard artists and, and, and Dong Yang is the animation studio of like really play into their strengths for the most part. Yeah, there's some there's some cracks in the armor and some of those close ups and and uh, and 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 Batman's design and things like that in the episode. But yeah, the backgrounds are tremendous, as you said. All the neon on the on the uh, on the billboards at the end are are a lot of fun. Uh, and all the all the all the driving is really well done. 
Um, yeah, and all, all, all the various uh, visual gags we've already talked about. Just uh, just a really strong job uh, all around. Absolutely. All right, Liam, let's move on to our next category, which is going to be music. And uh, one of our dynamic music partners, Miss Lita Ritmanis, responsible for this week's music. And uh, it's another one of those episodes, I think, that uh, from your opening uh, your opening credits uh, to the time that the title card is revealed, you it really sets the tone as to what the episode is going to be as we have the Harley theme play immediately uh, accompanying things. And uh, it's, the Harley theme is certainly recurring throughout the episode from our uh, from the hijinks that occurs. And uh, I, I love that uh, that's probably the most recognizable thing that is the refrain that's played throughout the episode. And uh, but Miss Ritmanis really does look to to tailor it to whatever the uh, the scene is requiring, whether it's, you know, the the opening sequence where uh, you're, you're just kind of setting the mood with her sitting with her with the doctor or uh, towards the end as uh, as the Harley theme plays uh, it's sort of. Uh, as as visually, you're watching her go from being blown off of the the one the one billboard to the spoon, and then launching to the other. It's just playing this sort of dumpy, goofy, off the wall. You know, this you can't believe this is happening to this to to our uh, to our main focal point of of the episode. Um, and then it it's played at the end, also of course, is in in various different. Uh, tempos and various different uh major and minor keys but that's the major theme that uh that plays throughout uh i do think we get uh we get the batman theme played a couple times once uh, of course in his reveal uh, at uh at boxy's uh location when he shows up there and saves the day saves harley and veronica from perhaps being uh done away with and then uh, when he saves harley at the end as well he swoops in and uh we get the batman theme once again played i love the music the sort of lumbering and pending doom music that's played with the uh with the the tank arrival and the reveal it's just this these deep sounding horns and it's sort of a sort of like a warning warning shot we get it show up and it's just this deep low rumble and then it continues to sort of almost as if it's like a siren or a, a warning horn that's going off, uh, you know, alerting that this, this gigantic piece of war machinery is chasing after our, our, uh, our focal point for the episode. So yeah, there's a lot of great music. Harley's theme is incredible. It's another one of those pieces that just, you can hum it all day long if you needed to. It fits the character so well. I feel like it punctuates the episode incredibly well also. Um, but those are the music points that I had uh, as far as uh, as far as that. Did I miss anything that you felt was noteworthy or if not, what were your uh, what were your overall thoughts? No. Yeah, I think you covered all the all the big beats. Yeah, I do. I do really love the Harley theme. It's it's used even in a lot of the action sequences in the chase sequences, um, which uh, I think is uh, is a great bit there. Um, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed the uh, the the fight music in the fish market. I think is really is really strong as well. So um, uh, yeah, for for all those reasons, I ended up giving music a, a another seven out of ten. So I uh, I enjoyed music quite a bit. Yeah, I just went one tick higher. I went eight out of ten uh, when it came to my music score. There, it's uh, I think it's really strong. I uh, really, really enjoyed it. And that Harley theme is certainly one of the more memorable pieces um, that uh, will be stuck in my my head for quite a few days, I'd have to imagine. All right, Liam, let's move on to our final category of the day, which, of course, is going to be our voice acting and uh, actors and actresses. Excuse me. We uh, don't have a huge cast. We have uh, several series regulars, of course, but uh, a couple of guest stars with uh, some of our other characters here involved. Let's go ahead and review those voice actors for this week's episode. That's right. So we do have a nice size voice cast here. We have a few returning names. Uh, very briefly, we have Henry Pollock II <laughs> as Scarecrow. Great bit. Great bit to start the episode. Um, obviously, we're going to save most of our, our lead Sorkin praise for the end. But uh, um, yes, that opening scene where our Harley and and uh, and Dr. Leland as voiced by Suzanne Stone 
uh, are speaking and having this kind of heart to heart about how Harley's on the road to recovery and, and, and she can have a normal life. And then just like out of, out of, out of shot, you don't even see him at first. You just hear him <laughs> shouting and he's, <laughs> he's the God of fear. And how dare you, uh, you know, manhandle me. I, I will make you all cower before me. And then he, he sees Harley and it's just, just hello child. And then goes back to, <laughs> and then goes back to threatening Batman and Robin. It's such a good gag. And uh, Mr. Pollock uh, does a great job with it. I love uh He says, scream hosannas of anguish to scarecrow. <laughs> like it's just, it's just the most over the top. And I know, I know obviously we have, uh we have the great Jeffrey Combs ends up being recast as the scarecrow mm-hmm. for our, for our new Batman adventures, but there's just something about that choice for that character to be that over the top thespian. He's delivering it. Like he's, you know, he's from the stage, a, a Shakespearean dot monologue, you know, cower before me, scream hosannas of anguish to scarecrow. <laughs> like just, it's yeah, it's so, so, so funny. And then of course, like he pauses and he's just talking normally. <laughs> to Harley, And then he goes again, <laughs> perfectly written by paul dini and uh it, you know the the funny thing I, I we we i we could have talked about this probably afterwards when we were talking about rewatchability or what have you but interestingly like this episode very much feels like a comic book and there is a like i think believe there is a book adaptation that was done for this a children's book adaptation for this oh, yes. episode that was done with art by bruce tim uh but it, like i watching this i was like this could have been a, a a Paul Dini comic like I this plays out exactly like it, even if the images were static that you were watching in in little pa- or looking at little panels like it would have communicated with the dialogue and the visual gags it would have communicated just the same and that's that's it, its own unique testament of things there but yeah that that dialogue of the scarecrow screaming there was just something that like if I was reading this on the page it would it would come off exactly the same way. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, just just uh, just brilliant, uh, brilliant job by him. We have the returning uh, Dick Miller as Boxy Bennett once again. Uh, very enjoyable. Very uh, just, you know, stereotypical slimy, slimy uh, gangster. Um, but uh, a lot of fun hearing him mix it up with uh, with with some of our cast again. And uh, we also have Franklin Cover or Cover as uh, General Vreeland. Fantastic just such a he's he's hamming it up in the best way possible and is uh you know just from that from that scene in gordon's office too (laughs) when he when he when he says whatever like unhand your uh (laughs) unhand your hostage as he's firing tank 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 missiles at her (laughs) he's so over the top and silly and uh and uh the bit where it's 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 mr cover uh dick miller's boxy and uh bobby costanza as uh as Gordon and they're all like trading lines of what appears to be the same sentence of like, I've got you now, you lousy stinking yep. <laughs> crazy clown lady or whatever. Like the there those three going, you know, beat for beat for beat there is uh, is a great bit of timing and a great bit of editing as well. So good. Yeah. The just his uh his performance uh, as as the general uh Mr. Co- speaking of Mr. Cover is uh is just he is asked to be over the top and animated. And I love that he comes in like guns blazing initially. And then he like calms down and you get the like trick little beat where he just needs, needs Gordon to get out of the room so that he can call for a code red, which apparently code red just means he gets a tank that he can drive around. In. <laughs> just one tank. I assume maybe there's another guy in the tank with him. Cause he like does the thing where he bangs on the lid at one point. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, yeah, you would imagine there's, there might be, but I just love that he has the authority as the general to just get a tank deli- like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to take the tank out for a little spin. All right. Just I'll, I'll be back in a little bit here. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> it's just uh, a, so funny. Yeah. At the, yeah. Again, great timing. Great job by, uh, by Mr. Cover as well there. But yes, we do also briefly have Bob Hastings as Commissioner Gordon uh and uh and then uh playing a big part in this episode probably i guess she had uh birds of a feather this is so this is probably uh one in one a uh for uh for mary lou henner as uh as veronica she's great she's so funny and just so exasperated i love the bit of her and and uh her taking bruce shopping and uh and then just every just her 
over the top reaction. It's it is a lot of screaming, but I just I just think she does uh, so well playing off of uh, of course Kevin Conroy and, and of course Arlene Sorkin as well. But uh, maybe maybe my favorite Verona, Veronica Vreeland episode, or at least one of uh, one of her best, along with Birds of a Feather, maybe. Yeah, as as you've said, she doesn't get she only gets a couple of starring roles, but this is a pretty good one. And uh, obviously she she gets to kind of play the damsel in distress. But I, I think that what's interesting to me is they went so far as to decide to give uh, to give her sort of a a bit of a redeeming quality there where she decides she she makes this promise to Harley, which feels like it could just be the rich person empty promise she's initially trying to bribe her like, hey i'll give you money just let me go and harley's not interested in that so that causes her to kind of look at the situation that harley's in and even for veronica to have a little bit of sympathy for her and say you know what all i care about is just getting home safe if you get me home safe as long as i'm alive i'm not going to press charges against you and then at the end when Harley's kind of accepted her fate and she's back at Arkham and feels like she's back to square one, that's when, you know, uh, Dr. Reland, what, what's her name? I, I keep forgetting. It. Uh, uh, Leland. Leland. It's Reland and Leland. I was like, it rhymes with Reland. Like famous the, Detroit Tigers manager, Jim Leland. Jim Leland. <laughs> Should be that easy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So when Dr. Leland breaks the news to her, she's like, well, Veronica didn't didn't press any charges against you. It's like, oh, that's awesome. Like they they didn't have to include that little bit there. But it also just lends you to or lends to show you that Veronica Vreeland is not not just your typical like ritzy rich person that has no morals or has, you know, that stereotypical rich person character. It's like, look, they have a little bit of she has a little bit of a heart, too. That works out well for this. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Now she's uh she's great there. And uh so rounding out our, our main cast, I think we're gonna save our, our villain for last because it's just such her episode. But obviously r- rounding things out, we do of course want to talk about Lauren Lester as Robin and Kevin Conroy as Batman. Um, like you said, it's it's like as, as we alluded to, a lot of this, as much as it is uh Harley's episode and Mary Lou Henner's Veronica's episode um these these bookend scenes of batman sort of being there for harley and and like i said kind of providing like the emotional heart of the episode um not uh, if you're looking for like total quantity of minutes this is probably on the lower end for a for a kevin conroy batman the animated series episode but uh we talk about quality um that final scene in uh in arkham with with him and, and harley is uh just wonderful Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, even as I said, even when he's Bruce at the beginning and he's knocking on the door and he's trying to like stop this out of control train before it leaves the station, uh, it's, it's, you can tell he's like, he's, he's showing some compassion. He's trying to have heart. And, uh, yeah, the, the very end that he shows up with a dress and he's being very, uh, kind. Like there's kindness in his voice, there's gentleness in his voice. There's all these things that you, typically don't associate with batman when he's interacting with his villains and it's 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 just a it's a testament of course not only to the writing but the fact that uh, the late great mr conroy was able to, to evoke that emotion and communicate that effectively through through the dialogue so yeah uh the the moments that he has he has of course the cool moment where he gets to interrupt boxy also uh where boxy says you know i'm the one who who makes the <laughs> makes the uh the calls around here got it and then batman answers him with a got it and then proceeds to pick the whole crew apart <laughs> uh so yeah there's there's there's, there's uh, not a lot for him to do, so not a lot of uh, meat on the bone as far as volume is concerned. But uh, I think he, he, of course, made the most of those those bits where he did have to uh, communicate some some uh, some more gentle, kinder version of Batman. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, that just leaves us with our with our main eventer here, Arlene Sorkin as uh, as Harley. Uh, oh my goodness, this is. You know, I was debating in my head and we'd probably have to just go back at the end and and look at scores to figure out which this or Harlequinade I like better. She doesn't have a song in this one. So I think Harlequinade maybe holds a more special place in my heart. Um, And obviously we haven't reviewed Mad Love yet. Um, So there's there's other great Arlene Sorkin performances. But again, she's so funny in this episode. And she also like you feel sorry for her the whole time because she's freaking out. 
And like for all the reasons you already talked about, like, you know, she's freaking out. She doesn't understand what's happening. She's scared. And she's just she the the mania <laughs> of what she's going through. I think she she portrays that so well of just the general stress. Um, I think this might have my favorite single line, though, which is where she uh, attacks Batman at the end. And then very matter of fact, it says, I'm having a bad day. Yeah, I, uh, I repeat that all the time. So that's uh, this. This might be the most iconic Harley. Uh, this is, you know, it's one of three probably most iconic Harley uh, performances by Miss Sorkin. If I if I may be so bold. Yeah, it's 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 uh, I I don't know how to describe it other than just it's wonderful. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great, great uh, roller coaster of emotions that she goes on. You do get a little bit of the, obviously she's playing a character that is clinically insane or was clinically insane at the start of the episode. And she begins to just crack throughout the entire uh, episode to the point where, as you, as you said, it sort of culminates with this dialogue that she has with Batman at the very end. But it's great because the, you kind of see see her and the whole thing is that she's done the work that's at least convinced the people at Arkham uh, that she's that she's cured. So if that was true, you're either if it wasn't true and they let her out, you're making the people at Arkham look like idiots or in the you would have to show or communicate in some form or fashion that she isn't as insane as let's say the Joker. And I think Ms. Sorkin's performance gets that, gets that point across where she is, she's just there. She's having this monologue talking about, she's believing that she can change. And then, you know, all of a sudden the alarms go off and she's transported back to thinking that she's a criminal and has to act like one. So, but some of the downbeats and the, the conversations that she has with Veronica and the, even the conversations that she has with Boxy and uh, yeah, there it's a, it's a, from start to finish a, a, an incredible episode. And um, you know, it's probably, if you wanted to see uh, Miss Sorkin's best work, uh, it would be, I would be hard pressed to put, another episode up is like, Hey, this is better. I think you're right. I think, uh, I think, you know, having, having, uh, her, her, uh, sing is probably would, would have been the only thing that could have taken this to the stratosphere per se, but it's, uh, it's really good. It's, she's fantastic and sorely missed, uh, certainly, you know, it, anybody that voices Harley after this, of course, is going to have some giant shoes that uh, will probably never be able to be filled uh, at this point. Uh, so it's uh, it's nice to be able to go back and, and watch a performance at, at this level from the person that was that was quite literally the the story was or the character was created for and and see just exactly what Harley's voice truly sounds like. So, uh, yeah, a, a plus from Sorkin's uh, performance. Yeah, couldn't have said any better myself. So uh, I think for for all those reasons, I felt uh, uh, almost like I had no choice but to give this another 10 out of 10. Love it. Yep, uh, I am right there with you, my dude. Uh, couldn't, couldn't give it anything else but a perfect 10 out of 10. Well, uh, so yeah, I, that, uh, that will bring us to the... Whoa, that's... Uh, that sound there that you just heard is, in fact, the bonus point sound. And uh, it's not for me this week, Liam, so it must be for you. That's right. Uh, first time in a while I think I've had a, a bonus point. But, yeah, mine is uh, one we we often, I think, give out bonus points for here on the show, and that is uh, the title card for this episode. Um, most of the title cards were designed by... Uh, by Eric Radomski and I think drawn by, by various artists, but um, yeah, this one, this one is so iconic, you know, Harley with the, with the big hat. We, I almost wish we had gotten her in this outfit in the episode, mm -hmm. she's got like this big red hat and like the red jacket and then the, and the skirt and everything like, and that the hyenas wrapping the leash around her legs and, and, and rush rushing off to either side of her. I mean, this one's so iconic that they made a, a statue out of it. There's a, there's a DC direct uh, collectible statue of her, even though she doesn't actually appear in the, uh, in the episode in this outfit there is a uh there's a statue made of this so i think this is uh this is also probably in the running for one of the 
you know, five, five or, or 10, maybe most iconic uh, title cards of the whole series. So I just wanted to give an extra point for that. Love that. That's uh well-deserving. We love the title cards for this series. Uh, Brothers Warner and or D- Detective Comics Comics. Uh, when are you going to drop the title cards as a collectible like coffee table book or something like I, you guys are leaving money on the table <laughs> hire us please all right liam well that will bring us uh now that we've totaled everything up uh totaling up my scores i end up with a 36 out of 40 meaning back-to-back weeks now uh we have had a top pick here uh for our episodes uh what about you Yeah, I am just a couple points lower at uh, 35 out of 40, but uh, still a tremendous episode, still a uh, just uh, absolute blast. And I mean, as we talk about rewatchability, I mean, it's already in in the top uh, pick section, as you mentioned, based on your score. But I mean, double thumbs up. This is it's a masterpiece of an episode, one of the one of the best of the whole series. And uh, it's it's pretty relevant to to Harley Quinn. Like we said, this is one of her this is. Uh, even though she is kind of on her own for a lot and she gets the spotlight, certainly in other episodes before this, um, she, this is her solo act. I mean, we, we see poison Ivy for a second at the end for that, that little gag, but um, there's no Joker. There's no Ivy. This is really her episode. And obviously as, as you talked about, there's, you know, this is the building blocks for major motion pictures and, and her own, you know, animated series and, hundreds and hundreds of issues of uh, critically acclaimed comic books. Like this is, uh, this is one of those giant building blocks uh, for, for what the character would become later on. So this is like, this is not only relevant to the DCAU, it's relevant to DC. <laughs> like it's relevant to right. the history of, uh, you know, of, of the, of the character and the history of the entire comic making and uh, superhero organization uh, or superhero industry as it, as it went on was, uh, was uh, this, this first Harley solo outing. So uh, yeah, yeah, massively important. Uh, Maybe the easiest double thumbs up we've, uh, we've had for a a rewatchability question in a while. Yeah. uh, I, I don't have any reason to say why this shouldn't be two thumbs up. It's uh, it's important to the series. It's a great showcase. It's a funny episode. It's Paul Dini and Kevin Altieri working together. Um, it's it's tremendous. Definitely advise uh, going out of your way if you haven't seen this episode in a while. Put it on. It's uh, it's on your favorite streaming app. I'm sure you can find it somewhere streaming on the internet if you don't have a streaming app to watch it on, or pull out the DVDs, or dust off the VHS, or whatever. Uh, pull it out and, and give it a, a another viewing. It's it's a fun one. Certainly worth the uh, the time, and you'll be chuckling along with us just as we were this week. All right, Liam, let's go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Now we get to the part where we talk about how you can support the podcast. If you'd like to support us, there's several different ways to do so. Easiest way to do so is subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. If you do subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app, uh, app, the next step would be to leave us a review. A five-star review would be greatly appreciated, especially if you listen on uh, on uh, Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. If you do listen on Apple Podcasts and you want to take an even further step, leave a little blurb, tell people what you like about the podcast. Heck, if we see it and read it on the air and you live within the U.S., the continental United States, we'll send you a thank you gift uh, just for stopping and you, taking the time to do so. Uh, you can also support the podcast by checking out the show notes. There's a link to our store to pick up a piece of merchandise to support the podcast, or if you want to become a monthly supporter, like several of our listeners already do, you can do so as well. There's a link for both of those in the show notes of the episode. Uh, of course, you can also support us by following us on Instagram and on Twitter slash X at DCAU Review, as Liam noted at the top of the program. Uh, you can also, of course, interact with us on there. We have people every week who send us their thoughts on the episode. They slide into our DMs and tell us uh, their memories of the show. It's one of one of, if not the best thing about doing this is getting mm-hmm. people's feedback. We have people that uh, feel like friends at this point that send us send us Christmas cards and and are you know are willing to take time out to to say kind things to us and share their memories. We've had some some real great uh, great things shared over the last couple of weeks, especially with these particular episodes. I, I think like. 
like us, these episodes, because of how great they are and, and how memorable they are, a lot of people have some nostalgic feelings about these ones, Liam. And uh, it's been great to hear and uh, and read people's thoughts on these uh, over the last uh, several months here. However, we are going to be turning the calendar page. Well, actually, that's not true. We're close to turning the calendar page, and next week will be the fifth Saturday of the month. And Liam, so the fifth Saturday of the month, this being, of course, the month of March, lands on March the 30th, which means from that date, if you count two days forward, it is, of course, the Day of Fools. Mm -hmm. April Fool's Day falls on that following Monday, so... Next week, it snuck up on us somehow already. Next week will be our April Fool's Day episode. Whew. <laughs> and uh, boy, we have an interesting one uh, to to discuss next week. It's going to be lots of fun. That is right, Cal. And uh, you'll have to stay tuned to our social medias for the exact episode. But we can tell you one thing for sure. And it's going to be exciting. It's going to be extreme. Uh, we will be visiting for the first and, if we're honest, only time uh, in our show's uh, entire run, if I had to guess. We will be looking at a very exciting episode of a classic X-Men cartoon next week for the April Fool's Review. Uh, one week only, one time a year only, and uh, we uh, have not dipped our toes into the the mutant side of the Marvel animated universe just yet. So excited to uh, to take a look at that next week. And it has nothing to do with the fact that people are going to be talking about the X-Men and that they are uh, hashtags and we are not <laughs> trying to take advantage of any sort mm. of social media engagement with our opportunity to do so. Nope, not trying to get any early, uh, not trying to capitalize on any SEO from the new X-Men cartoon. We're not trying to capitalize on the, the constant fervor of, uh, of, of the need for updates on this Deadpool and Wolverine movie that's coming out this summer. No, P- purely coincidental. That's right. We decided to do an X-Men <laughs> thing uh, this year. Uh, but uh, yeah, so stay tuned for the uh, the exact uh, of what and and where and why we'll be we'll be uh, reviewing it. But yes, we will be reviewing something a classic X Men cartoon next week, and uh, that's another one that people people we're the we're the uh, we're the outliers. We didn't really grow up watching an X Men cartoon, or we did, but it was one of the later ones. Uh, but that that classic X Men cartoon, if if in fact that is what uh, what wins the poll. Uh, boy, people people go nuts for that show. Obviously, it's why they're bringing it back after uh, after almost thirty years. So uh, excited to see what the uh, what the listeners pick for us to listen to, and uh, it will be very, as I said, exciting, extreme, and a third uh, Excelsior. <laughs> Excelsior. <laughs> I'm just excited that we get to break out our Stanley impersonations, uh, our, our annual Stanley impersonation. Even, if, even be- if we did Star Wars, I think we'd still have to work in Stanley <laughs> on the April Fool's every year. I think that's just a rule now. <laughs> it's part of the gimmick. We have to pull it out. Uh, don't miss it. You won't want to miss it. It's going to be a blast as it is each and every year. I can't wait to do that with you. But until then, I'm Cal. And I'm Liam. And we'll talk to you on the very next silly April Fool's edition of the DCAU Review. Bye-bye.